Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ayana Mid Plaza, Jakarta, Indonesia. My name is Malati Dewi. I will help to moderate in the panel discussion. But before that, let us open the second session in the second half of the day. Let's give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's working. So, um, Salamat uh, Siang and uh, Dan Abakaba. I'm, I'm also really fine because you are here and we have this great um, we have this great event or we have great panelists and I'm here to give you a very short introduction about our institute, the Humboldt Institute for Internet Society, and a little bit some words maybe about the project. Um, so. We have also provided, of course, some slides. And I have to say, we provide, provided the slides um, in English, and but also in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, hopefully, that, that will, that will, um, that will help you at all. I'm Amasaya Stefan, as I said. And um, as I also said, um, I'm here for the Humboldt Institute for Internet Society. I hope you can, can see it here. And we are a research institute um, studying internet and digitalization in general and we are, of, we are of course interested in all these more technical topics um, internet about algorithmic management about the use of um, ai to support certain processes and that's, that's one of our focus of course and the other focus is really the impact so what is the impact okay sorry so so what is what is the impact of technology, of especially digital technologies like AI, on the society. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious that innovations have a big impact on societies. And we are studying the more positive and the challenges and also the negative um, consequences of digital technology. So that's our research interest. And we are also not only a research institute, so, but we are also very much focused on um, knowledge transfer. So to use the academic knowledge also on the ground, learn, learn from local projects and to each other. So that's the idea. And this event is embedded in a bigger project. Um, it's called Sustainability, Entrepreneurship, and Global Digital Transformation. And it's uh, the funding, we have funding from the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit on the behalf of the German uh, Federal Ministry of Economics, Cooperation, and Development. And the goal is also to have this knowledge transfer and have uh, and also to have some kind or to start some kind of collaboration with different actors, especially from the South, about sustainability, entrepreneurship, yeah, and the digi digital. And here you see our partner countries. So we are active at the moment on four continents, uh, America, a lot of partner countries, of course, in Africa, only one country in Europe. I mean, we are based in, Ger in, in Berlin in Europe, so if you are in Berlin, please um, come to Zurich. And two countries in Southeast Asia. Um, recently, we were in Vietnam, and now we are in Indonesia. And it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, as I said. And maybe um, give me the chance to also say a few words about um, our topic, our research topic, and why we are interested in this. So the idea is to uncover a bit this kind of challenges, the potential and also the potential of digital technologies. And I mean, when I speak about digital technologies, I speak about very different digital technologies like GIS data, but also social media and Twitter data and how we could use all these different kinds of data and tools to make sense um, and to foster rainforest protection. So that's the aim. And we have some guide guiding questions that we also recently discussed. It's about education, how could we educate people? What is the role of open data? Because we know we, there are a lot of data in the world, but of course, to make sense of the data, you need education, but there's also a need for a kind of a open data. And the last point is this funding question. And um, that's, uh, that was, um, that's the idea of this event. And we also conducted a study and I will hand over to Roland 
he's conducting the study. The, the, conduct the study is also about these topics and he's in the process of data collection and analyzing the current uh, digital tools that are used in Indonesia for rainforest protection. So I will hand over to Roland. Thank you very much, Dr. Bond. Now let's invite Mr. Roland. He will deliver several key uh, findings. He represents the ASIIG. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Stefan. Nice to see so many of you here today. So, as Stefan mentioned, I looked with a colleague at how digital technology is currently being used in Indonesia to support rainforest protection and to make rainforests more resilient. And when we talk about resilience, we basically look at three elements. First of all, we look at how do we prepare for the shocks and disturbances that will affect the rainforests within the country. So this is, so this is very much around the monitoring side of things. Look at that, how is technology being used to respond to the threat? So what do we do once we know there is maybe a forest fire or there are cyclones coming in or whatever? Right, and I'm very pleased that we have an excellent speaker today on our panel that can give some real life practical examples about this. But then lastly, for resilient for rainforests to be truly resilient, we need them to recover and to revitalize after a shock or disturbance takes place. So we also try to understand what role does technology currently play in this. Um, and sadly, that's an area where we don't see that much action yet, but hopefully our panelists can indicate some, some areas of development where we see more work around restoring rainforests using technology. So without repeating myself from either this morning or the study that we will eventually publish as well on this, just a few key of topics or opening questions for you to think through as we enter the panel discussion. And the first one is around digital literacy, particularly what role technology can play um, and what role stakeholders can play in it, making sure that people can use the information that currently exists and implement it in the ground. So what we see is that in Indonesia, there is an incredible human resource base. There are a lot of talented people who can use the most modern GIS technology, etc. But we see that there is a challenge on the ground, especially at local community forestry projects, of using this. We see that there is enormous potential to engage with communities in biodiversity monitoring, but for that to be effective, the tools and technologies need to be adapted and people need to understand how to use them. So there is a big question around digital literacy. Well, secondly, when we talk about open data, we see that data are increasingly available. We now have free satellite imagery available through Landsat and through Sentinel images from the European Space Agency, but these are not always accessible for people and projects um, again, especially the smaller ones at, at local or community level, do not always have the skills to analyze and process the data that exists. Yet we've seen in the past 10, 15 years with the advent of cloud computing that new opportunities arise to work with global players or stakeholders here in Jakarta to do some of the analysis and processing. So I would very much like to have a discussion around how do we open up data that exists? And how do we close the gap from technological possibilities to practical action on the ground? And then thirdly, it's about livelihoods. I think everyone in this room and globally benefits tremendously from the vital function of rainforests as a carbon sink, as a viable ecosystem. But we shouldn't forget that from the, the tens of millions of Indonesians that depend on the rainforest, conserving them, them might not be a prime priority if they have more direct and pressing needs for their livelihoods. So we need to think about, sure, rainforest protection is important. It's something we all care about, but we 
we also need to understand this in a changing world whereby there is increased global demand on forest resources, be it timber, be it minerals under the crown, or be it palm oil production. So how can we use technology to support people in developing livelihoods that are sustainable and allow us all globally and in Indonesia to benefit from the rainforest? And I look forward to particularly one of our speakers who is really an expert in helping to come up with sustainable solutions that are driven by technology. And with that, I'll hand back the, the microphone to us. Thank you so much, Mr. Roland. Give a warm applause. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's start the, the panel discussion. Hold on, I will not sing today because uh, despite the microphone is gold color, but I will not sing. I will only speak about rainforest protection in Indonesia. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the multi-stakeholder dialogue discussing digital technologies for rainforest protection. I hope colleagues, uh, you have had lunch and we all are healthy and enthusiastic to share our knowledge in this panel discussion. So are you ready? I didn't hear any responses. Are we ready? Uh, less enthusiastic. Can you be more enthusiastic? Okay, that's good. So let's start. Just like an old saying, if you don't know, then you cannot care. So uh, I hope you can, by knowing me, you can care about me. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Melati Dewi. I am professional communication strategy and language specialist. I have worked with GIZ uh, with, uh, in the last two decades as an independent consultant. Several last projects that we done is transfer program. Transfer program is a uh, uh, government of Germany and government of Indonesia collaboration program to facilitate mitigation action in the area of transportation, energy, water, and climate change, and project case. Case is clean, affordable, and secure energy for Southeast Asia. This is ongoing program until 2024. And the last program that we are delivering is GII project, or Green Infrastructure Initiative. Today, I will be the moderator. And this is a true honor to moderate the panel discussion today. So without further ado, let us start. So uh, see me as uh, doing a monologue, so it, hopefully it will not bore you. So colleagues, as we all know, Indonesia has one of the most biodiverse uh, rainforests in the world that is valuable for the surrounding communities and bring benefit to the global climate. To protect forests, preventing illegal deforestation and promote sustainable development in Indonesia. Along with this objective, the use of digital solution is increasing. This includes the use of drone and satellite to collect data, to share solution and best practices, and the use of uh, diverse data collection to build a vegetation and climate model. However, uh, this technology development uh, come with a big challenge. This discussion panel has the objective to discuss about the segment and aspect of rainforest protection by using technology in a broader context and intended to the stakeholders that has interest to promote public debate about the challenges and possibilities. The discussion the panel discussion will cover a political aspect, a government representative, technological expert, and representative from NGO with the uh, context to uh, preserve a diverse Indonesian environment. So I would like to invite the panelists to come to the stage. Let's welcome. First, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, very young speakers. 
Mr. Muhammad Areza Mustahid or in short Boge. So uh, welcome Mas Boge. So if we hear Ali Topan, what comes into our mind? Ali Topan is a, a street name. So he is an AI expert. So similar to Ethan Hunt. And the second panelist is Restu Aminola. Now, Mr. Boge is full stack engineer lead from UN Global Post Lab. Second, we have Restu Aminolo. He is senior product manager from Borneo Nature Foundation. So, uh, let's come to the stage, Mr. Restu Aminolo. The third panelist is Mr. Faris Kuku Harwinda, senior product manager from Cultiva. Uh, Mr. Kuku, please come join us on the stage. So, Boge, aka AI expert, and Restu is a special expert uh, from reading his portfolio. Kuku is tech expert. So, everything related to tech is associated to him. FinTech, uh, AgriTech, Climate Tech. It seems that the position is not really fair. Uh, Mr. Kuku would like to move to this seat because. Uh, okay, I'm gonna switch my position so to make it more comfortable and convenient. Let's uh, focus on the presentation. Now we have time limitation, so I cannot read the portfolio of the AI tech and the special experts of because they have a long portfolio. So I'm afraid we don't have enough time, but we can share the link to let you know who is Boge, who is Restu, who is Kuku. So I would like to know first from Mr. Boge. Uh, you have a very cute name, I believe there's a story behind that. However, we are talking about technology. When we wake up in the morning, we immediately grab our mobile phone. So we immediately op turn on our mobile phone to check our work, to take selfie, to check social media. And technology is very close to all of us. And we see there is UN uh, Global Post Lab. So we would like to understand what uh, Boge is doing under the UN Global Post Lab. So maybe you can share with us what are the leading projects that you are doing and what are the progress and what actually you do. So again, I would like to invite, uh, can we have more microphone? Can someone help us to uh, get more microphone? Okay. Okay, let's give another round of applause. Mr. Boge, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, madam. So my name is Boge. You can just call me Boge. I am full spec, full stack engineer lead under the UN Global Post Lab. We have four labs uh, in New York, India, Kampala, and Indonesia. Now, UN Post Lab in Jakarta is one of the big data lab. Collaboration between the government of Indonesia and UN. And because this is a lab, then our focus is in uh, research and innovation, uh, meaning that what kind of innovation that we can deliver. And we have two uh, subjects. Uh, qualitative research in social science, and second, quantitative research. We have uh, data team, data engineering, data analytics, and so on and so forth. And my, the focus of my work is actually coding. On daily, day, on daily basis, I do coding, coding for data collection and data communication. So how data is collected, processed, uh, to build AI and become dashboard or visualization that can provide uh, ease uh, for the decision maker in making decision based on certain analysis. 
Jakarta Post Lab has been established since 2012 until 2022, and the contract is 10 years between UN and the government of Indonesia. And if I can say this is our last year. Officially, we actually have six more months until next year, but we will not stop because we plan to expand our wing, becoming United Nations Global Post Asia Pacific. So from Jakarta, expand to Asia Pacific region. We hope that our work can bring impact to other countries as well. With regard to the research or works that we are doing uh, in the end of this project, we are building natural uh, language processing for a report because every agency will have a report. So we are trying to do summarize because more report, more difficult to understand the core information from each report. So that is one of our research. We are focused to uh, extract the core of from each report. Uh, maybe summarization, classification from tax mining processing. Uh, that is what data team is doing. We also have another project, the left no one behind project. I believe you are familiar with this project because we also focus in that area and now we are focusing in statistics to find things that can help people with disabilities. So we would like to build a system that can help bring impact to them directly. It is still in data processing, information processing stage or phase. And that is the last two research that we are doing until June 2023. Maybe uh, that's all for now. Yes, thank you so much. So a uh, brief story from our AI experts. I'll now move to Mr. Kuku. Now, Mr. Kuku, I was uh, surprised. I thought you are a band uh, player because you are very, look very, uh, well, very uh, associated to, to, to a musician. Now, what is Cultiva, Mr. Kuku? Maybe you can share a story about what Cultiva is and what Cultiva is doing, what are the progress, over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, my name is Kuku, and I believe I have been introduced. I work in a company in the private sector named Cultiva. Cultiva itself is a technology company that is environment-based, climate and agriculture environment-based company. So whatever we are doing, we try to deliver innovation and in technology that can provide more insights to uh, our clients in their supply chain. So in this regard, we usually in partnering with a major corporation work in food and agriculture. So they often doing raw material sourcing and at the same time they would like to ensure whether they got the raw material uh, coming from farmers who are practicing good agricultural practice and whether they producing in a sustainably manner or not. So in this area, we try to provide technology that can help our client to ensure all the environment aspect, to ensure the sustainability aspect, and also uh, in the social aspect. So Mr. Koku has a presentation that can help us to provide insights about what uh, Cultiva is doing and the progress. OK, we all have the presentation. Mr. Christian, okay, we have the pointers. So, technically, what kind of progress that we have? So, as you can see on the screen, so our focus, we are trying to provide data, data to the end customer about the traceability and impact. So, uh, have you ever imagined when you eating something? Have you ever think if you eat? like cassava, where the cassava are coming from, who are the farmer, and whether the farmer is underpaid or is it in the minimum wage level, 
or whether they apply in a sustainable agriculture practices, we never know. And it is very difficult to trace it back to those aspects. So what we are doing at Qualify is illustrated like this. So we try to develop product or software in which the business model, we try to sell this product as services. So every company who work with us, they can access these services. Like we start from the geo tracing system. We try to uh, find out, try to identify who the farmers are based on the uh, coordinate or the location of their plantation and we take polygon sample. So this is like, like polygon comes in different sites, right? So we try to identify the size of the farmer's plantation and then visualize on a map. So after the data collection and geotracing data is collected, what we do next, we try to find the geospatial verification. We try to verify the data that we have collected so that we can determine whether one farmer practicing good practice. So we also gather data from the research conducted by several NGO or government agencies in which they share data set about the coordinate of the conservation area. So usually on the map, it comes in the form of layer. So uh, the form is layer, and then we try to overlay that with our layer using the application that we have developed. And we can see in the form of dashboard and in the form of map whether the farmer's land overlap with the conservation area. And from that aspect, we can find one parameter, uh, whether the farmer is doing sustainable way or not. Not stopping there, we from Cotifa also try to make sure the carbon emission. We also involve in several carbon projects, uh, still in the initiation stage. And lastly, uh, yeah, biochar, we are exploring in biochar as well. And not stopping there, Cotifa, we have one product or one application that can help the seller and buyer to do transaction and to book the transaction. And when that transaction is uh, documented in a standard in a tra standard trading, then in the second mobile apps you can find you can see a map and points that show the movement of uh, raw materials uh, starting from the farmers going to the traders going to processors or warehouse and then move to the end product let's say you eat a uh, chocolate in the wrapping you can see the qr code and when you scan the qr code you can get the information about the farmer about the supply chain and about the sustainability aspect so more or less, uh, and those are the work that we are doing. Very good, Kuku. I think we need to give a round of applause to Kuku. And let's invite Mr. Rustu to explain about Borneo Nature Foundation. What project that Rustu is doing along with his team. And Rustu also has a presentation that he would like to share with us. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, Restu. Uh, my name is Restu Aminolo. I am from Borneo Nature Foundation. This is an NGO foundation that work in the area of conservation, research, community empowerment, and to raise community awareness from the education program that we have. With regard to BNF, or Borneo Nature Foundation, it is based in Central Kalimantan, in Palangkaraya. And then we also do protection activities, uh, rainforest 
protection activities. We work in three landscape, pit lane landscape in Sembangau National Park, in Kerangas landscape, in Ruman, and Barito Hulu landscape. With regard to our experience in using technology, especially using air image, using drone, and using remote sensing technology, we have extensive experience since 2015, which all of us know during that period, Indonesia experiencing uh, multiple uh, forest fire in the rainforest. And utilizing drone technology to protect a forest area, especially in rainforest area. So in here, we would like to play a video of the result that we have so far. Uh, can you help me to play the video? So in here, we can see the pit swamp forest that is located in central Kalimantan province. So in here, I would like to introduce what rainforest is. Now, rainforest is a, a forest, a rainforest located in Indonesia. And this is a peatland forest in central Kalimantan province. We will play the challenges that uh, face the challenges to maintain the sustainability of the rainforest. And one of the challenges is uh, forest fire. Technology really helpful in doing uh, activities on uh, rainforest and using uh, using thermal drone, we can identify the spread of the hot spots that causing forest fires. This is an illustration of a forest fire that happened in 2019, especially the forest fire that happened in Sebangau National Forest. We also work with the local people in which we establish a community, a community called the community who care about fire or MPA. We also conduct a patrol uh, to protect the forest, uh, making sure for forest fire is not happening again. So we try to prevent forest fire, we try to prevent illegal logging, uh, try to prevent illegal fishing as well. The distance is 7 meter 20 centi. We also using drone technology to detect the spatial distribution of the orangutan, the special distribution of orangutan.
so a little bit more so those are a uh, short clip that I just play explaining the reason why we uh, do protection towards the rainforest and technology is created to help us to to, to do protection and to help our work in protecting the rainforest Thank you so much, Mr. Rustu. This is a knowledge that we need to know more. And considering the current condition, considering the progress made by UN, Polstrap, uh, Coteva, and BNF, I believe this is a very good achievement. People think that technology comes from uh, foreign countries. We are waiting the foreign countries to develop with some kind of new technology to provide software and so on and so forth. But domestically, technology has developed very far. We would like to know, learning from the experience from the local project and knowing from the local uh, experts on the ground, learning from uh, Cotifa, UN Post Lab, BNF, those are enabler. We have the technology, we have the software, we have the application, we have the design, we have the mapping. However, challenges are always there. Maybe you can share the challenges that always exist in every period of time, even though the technology has been updated, even though we have updated the team, the experts, but what challenges that always come up and always exist in every opportunity? Maybe we can start from Bob Gay can share about the challenges you are facing consistently. Yes, this is something that we have studied uh, try to identify what actually the biggest challenge that we face. Our lab often develop technology that we provided to the government for implementation. As simple as dashboard or analytical dashboard then can provide illustration about the current condition, about uh, the data behind that and to help the government creating the policy. The biggest challenge is the black box, the black box, the, uh, the existence of, of, of black box. So even though the research has come out with something, it, it doesn't immediately uh, translate it into a policy. So the information the result has come out with that information goes into a black box. A uh, black box is like a close meeting that government is doing and we cannot intervene. We cannot access the black box and we don't know what happened in the black box. We only contribute the information that comes from our research in which we hope the, 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 the decision at least at least consistent or aligned with the result of the research, but not always the case. Uh, there are sometimes the policy is inconsistent when the policy is uh, out, uh, is not consistent with the result of our research. Now in the uh, in the uh, so whatever result, whatever uh, research that we have come up with, it goes into the black box and we don't know what the process behind that and, and then it comes with the policy that is not consistent, not always consistent. Now, from that experience, we learn that the research, the technology, the analysis, not always uh, arbitrarily uh, come out with a consistent policy. So what we can do as a researcher, the dashboard analytical should not become too 
sophisticated. You know, we need to provide a dashboard that doesn't have to provide a huge uh, a result. Maybe just alert or just a simple forecast, just like uh, as simple as uh, there will be a forest fire that will happen. And when that alert warning goes into the government or goes into other government agencies, and then they can trace back. And every alert and every action that should be reported, that will uh, become another data. So from alert, action, and then it become a data. We will collect data that will provide insights and then help us to uh, give prediction. So address the challenge on how to uh, break the black box, then I think the solution we have to give information in a simple way, in a gradual way, from alert warning, forecast, and then goes into prediction. I think that is the biggest challenge uh, that we are facing at the moment because everyone say data for decision maker, data for decision making. But it comes with many challenges now. Data, decision maker, in between there's a black box. And this is a gap that we need to address. How we can intervene in the conversation that's happening in the black box. We have to make sure that the conversation in the black box also consider the analysis that we come up with. OK, thank you so much, Boge. And then move to the two. We see Ben F was very extraordinary. The video was very good. It makes me want to visit Palangkaraya. So let us go to Palangkaraya. Uh, so we see that you use many digital tools like GIS, you use drone, you also use social media to empower the knowledge. And there are several projects like smart or has gazer you use very sophisticated terms now you have on the ground experience and then combined with the local knowledge combined with the practices from the experts so again the same what are the challenges that persist that very difficult uh, like mr boge say there is this black box a huge gap in which we cannot you know address everything we cannot just submit all of the information. Now, that's from Boge side, but uh, what is from BNF side? Well, we utilizing the technology, uh, we actually more on uh, implementator. We actually implementing from the existing technology and we further develop it. Like uh, from the video, we use thermal drone. Previously, drone only bring or carry RGB camera, but we try to modify. We use thermal camera to detect forest fires. Now, the drone technology utilization in BNF started from the challenges that we found on the ground. First, about data, the satellite imagery data. Usually, monitoring done based on uh, satellite images about the hotspot and so on and so forth. Now, usually hotspot data, we continuously monitor using data from NASA, NASA film data, or MODIS satellite imagery. And the challenges are the data that we got is not real time. For hotspot data, NASA on daily basis will update the hotspot data on daily basis. And the same goes in Indonesia. We have LAPAN, the uh, Indonesian version of NASA. However, the data is not real time. The hotspot data is updated two times in one day, in the morning and in the evening or night time, whereby to protect the area in our effort to protect the area from forest fires, we need a real-time data. We don't know when fire can happen. And fire can cause by many factors. It can be uh, caused by human, like 90% caused by human, like they intentionally uh, cause forest fire. 
first of all, the to get a real time hotspot data. So we know this is the challenge, and then and then we have to strengthen our monitoring effort and conduct patrol during the dry season. Indonesia has two season: the rainy season and the dry season. Now, during the dry season, we try to do more patrol. And from the video, we can see that we conduct land-based patrol uh, from both uh, working with the local community uh, through the community groups that we have established. We also use drone in the patrol. We use drone to see and to do real-time and continuously monitoring. But at the same time, we also integrate uh, you, we also uh, integrate or use uh, imagery uh, satellite data. So when we find the hotspot from the satellite imagery data, and then we try to verify it using drone. And furthermore, we try to use technology to touch the site level. Uh, how we can use technology to protect the site area. Site meaning the, 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 the direct uh, actor, you know. Now, especially for drone technology is, is quite exclusive, meaning we have to continuously build the capacity of human resources so that the people can use the technology because it's a bit exclusive. Not everyone has the skill. Okay, Kuku from Coltiva. Talking about how important traceability is. So what is the biggest challenge that always uh, persists, even though you have modified even though you have modified things, even though you have built the capacity, but this huge challenge always persists. Can you share with us? Okay, thank you so much. So with regard to challenges in the lens or in the eye of product, because I work in developing technology product so that the client and user can accept the product. now. The challenge that always persists in the last few years, first, we are playing with information where information need to be measured, where uh, data that need to be collected using uh, standardized knowledge so that the data can be used by our client. And we hope that data, we, we try the data collection process will not bring, uh, will not burdening the farmers because we understand there are knowledge gap and farmers, they work in remote area in which uh, internet connection is not available. So I think that is the biggest challenge. So from the product point of view is how we make sure that the product is acceptable by our data collector by our field agent because most of them are former of farmers uh, their age about 45 years old uh, there is no internet connection so that what the challenges are and we also i also do one-on-one -on -one interview with the collectors uh, to see whether the button is too complex for the farmer and whether uh, a sophisticated visualization like using maps, uh, the supply chain flow, uh, can they understand that? And from that series of research that I do, what we always learn and we always try to improve our product, so it may in improve the engagement with the farmer so they are more open to collect data and in the context of rainforest they also more open to government regulation 
let's say, uh, conservation zone or whether they can uh, do production activities in that area. So in other side, because we are processing the data that we collect from the ground, then my work is more or less similar to Mr. Boge. We also produce an analytical dashboard in which that analytical dashboard should be helpful to our client to understand the existing condition on the ground. And dashboard uh, should give narrative of what actually happened on the ground. So the biggest challenge, not only about collecting data, but how we can tell a story from the data provided in the dashboard. So I have uh, several specific questions to Cultiva. How about from the carbon footprint uh, uh, perspective. Now, with regard to carbon footprint, it related to science survey that we try to implement in Cultiva's products. We know that carbon footprint is, uh, uh, is uh, many people uh, many people talk about uh, carbon footprint, especially people in Jakarta. We know that in Jakarta has huge uh, factories in the suburban area. Even agricultural industry also produce carbon, uh, let's say, in cattle, cattle farming. So we are now implementing several projects, uh, several carbon projects to measure how to measure these activities. We also conduct scientific research to identify which methodology that is uh, relevant to be applied in our product. So every carbon, any carbon survey will be combined with the existing product. So we don't have to innovate, we don't have to produce new product, but how we can use the existing product to calculate the carbon emission coming from certain agricultural land. And this project is still ongoing. It's still in research and development phase we, in which we hope that once we can get data from a farmer, we can calculate the carbon emission from one farmer. But on average, the project that we do is business to business meaning that we work with several major corporations in which they have many farmers in their company. So when we are able to collect all of the data, then we can help to measure whether a company, carbon emission-wise, whether they produce too much or not, or whether they have tried to save their carbon, whether they have tried to reduce their carbon emission through their uh, operations, if what happened based on the final data that the carbon emission is too high, then from Cultiva team usually recommended some initiatives like initiative A, B, C, and D uh, depends on the our client's condition. So I think we can draw a conclusion that we do have the software. The software is available, but the hardware also important. Okay, the applied technology is user-friendly already, but not necessarily is user-friendly, where education is very important to be shared to the users, like the independent farmer or the local community. And I would like to return to the discussion about black box. And there's a huge gap. So, ladies and gentlemen, there should be one more speaker joining from the government side, from BAPANAS or from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, but unfortunately uh, we don't have any representative from the government because when we talk about regulations, when we talk about policies, how to establish a synergy, we should have a representative from the government side. Unfortunately, we don't have any speakers from the policy side. But uh, back again to the tools. 
about the technology tool and the challenges. Now, Mr. Boge would like to know. Now, UN is an international global organization. And you have this haze geyser, in which we know this is a tools, uh, crisis analysis tools. Now, can you share with us? And this tools is used and proven on the ground, and, and it is uh, working. So maybe you can share a little bit story about this. So first of all, allow me to share some stories first. Hayes Gazer. We say this is a crisis analysis tool, which focus on forest fire. Actually, the uh, forest fire dashboard or system is uh, already quite many. However, we try to uh, uh, give something different. We don't do forest fire mapping or uh, like other NGO, they know the forest fire happening on the ground. However, Haze and Gazer is actually with our effort to see like when there is a forest fire, how it will impact to the community. Now the existing system maybe to detect forest fires or to see or to forecast uh, where forest fires may happen. Now our focus on not on that, but we want to see what the impact of forest fires to community and we try to build a dashboard to answer that question. First we try to collect satellite data to detect hotspot. So when we see hotspot on a map, and this is something that we built in 2015, they are, we identify there are several hotspots in uh, Central Kalimantan and Riau. So again, when there is a forest fire based on the hotspot, what will the community will complain about. So we try to mine Twitter data, Instagram data, YouTube data, and uh, radio data. So in here, we use artificial intelligence uh, language uh, processing. We process video, audio, and text data. And there are several uh, interesting information that we got. For example, when there is a forest fire, there one complain, or maybe there is one say, "Yay, school holiday!" and some actually happy. We also get information like this: this must be not caused by nature, but caused by human. So we try to capture this kind of information. What kind of signal that come out? And there is also a story, uh, I would like to apologize in advance first, maybe uh, there's a, a, a complaint or, or screaming that uh, this must be caused by company ABC and that we would like to mine. Uh, from that information we try to see the impact. Some screaming, we are the most affected people, help us, we need clean water. So this information that we try to capture, so we don't try to address the forest fire per se, but we would like to understand what happened in the surrounding community. And then we install, we report this to BNPB. BNPB is the National Disaster Management Agency. Now, BNPB not only focusing to put down the fire, but they also have responsibility to do evacuation. And this complaint, this uh, cry, from the community about clean water, food, mask, it often uh, cried by them. So when they conduct evacuation or when they do a field visit, they understand what they need to bring. So that information that we collect from Twitter, then from the data from Twitter, we try to classify which one goes to health classification, which one goes to education. It turns out that when there's a forest fire, it impacts many aspects like economy, education, and health. Now, furthermore, we try to collect Instagram data. Now, from Instagram data, we can get the actual pictures of the real situation. So the policymaker 
uh, can know. Even though he sits in Jakarta, he can see the pictures and photos of forest fires, so they know understand the case. Now, what exciting about Instagram, people not only photo the forest fires, but uh, the evacuating community also has photos. There's a hashtag like Rio Forest Fire. What also funny, there are individuals where their photos are about uh, shoes and hashtag uh, Rio Forest Fire. So they, they try to sell product, but they use this kind of hashtag. Uh, and, and there's a photo that vaping and smoking, and they use hashtag uh, haze. Now, those are uh, noise we need to filter we don't want to make sure those noise is not included in our analysis we have to uh, do uh, uh, image analysis making sure that only the relevant pictures that is included now goes into YouTube now YouTube is uh, Google's giant they have their own analysis so from YouTube we can provide local information because from the local TV, but correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I made a mistake, but there are news from the local news that doesn't go to Jakarta. But when they upload video to YouTube, and uh, non-TV media publish in YouTube, and uh, those information uh, is being collected. We also conduct audio mining. So those who cannot see the video, we convert it into text. Because sometimes the title is Forest Fire, but they talk using Google Audio, like Forest Fire, blah, blah, blah. Usually, we skip uh, those kind of video. We also filter the YouTube video, only focus uh, videos that can provide accurate information. So real-time information is something is what we display and use by BNPB, the National Disaster Management Agency. With regard to action on the ground, with regard to the actual forest fires, and the analysis about what caused the forest fire, well, we hope it already exists, and we hope other NGO, and I believe the government, has done that. Now, we actually focus beyond that. You know, We try to analyze the impact of the forest fire itself. It is being used. The result is very good. Unfortunately, in 2017, that system has to be cancelled. So what happened? So to maintain a system is difficult. It died, as we all know. And there was a, a invasion of uh, privacy data. Uh, the social media data that used by campaign. So this data is blocked. So Twitter data is no longer available. Instagram purchased by Facebook and they and YouTube is being updated. Um, they have their. Uh, uh, a different policy, and the radio is no longer available online, radio station. So those are our main source of data. So we cannot work if we don't have data from this feed. But we got lesson learned. We got the lessons. Uh, the lesson learned from the government and from our side, we cannot always rely on open data. Data is actually the new money. Data is the new gold. So whether we like it or not, we need to spend money to collect those data. And this is also what, you know, as an organization, we should not only utilizing the available data, but, you know, no matter what, all organization must become data provider. So we, as an organization, must feed data, but at the same time produce data. So when we are unable to purchase data, then we can do data exchange. So the business model is like uh, data exchange. You use my data, I use your data, and we produce something uh, good. So no matter what the organizations are, no matter how big or small, uh, each organization needs to have data. And that's something that we can utilize. 
And from that point forward, the BNPB start to collect data. They try to improve their system. So the data become neat. So when there are organization come to their office, uh, they can exchange the data. So those are the lesson learned that we got when from what uh, open data and is being closed. And even NASA, NASA, they also they turn off their open data API and then and we cannot get any info from that. So that's the lesson learned we got because data is considered as the new gold. Then we also have, uh, we also have, you know, we need to have our own gold as well. So, Mr. Bogiel, like we can see, our microphone has gold color. Well, anyway, I thought mining only happened in the oil and gas sector. It turns out mining also happened in the technology context. Data information is the new gold. So, who doesn't have Bitcoin now? Who doesn't have cryptocurrency now? Who doesn't have NFT now? So, from and the user, the local community, they also collecting this kind of technology. So uh, we can see the ripple effect. So what I can summarize, yeah, data is the new gold. But I also hear uh, the local community, even though the trending topic hashtag is not related to forest fire, and there should be some filter, some assessment. Now, moving back to Kuku Erzdu, the role of local community, how important the local community, what are their contributions to help Cultiva, to help vision and mission Cultiva and vision and mission of BNF. So let's start, uh, let's start from Erzdu. What is uh, BNF perspective about the role of local community? Well, local community is key for protecting the conservation area and to protect rainforest. Local community is the front line. Their function is the uh, guardian of the rainforest itself. And for the local community, we also learn many things from them. For example, in doing protection, protection from forest fire, they know more about how to protect their own area. But at the same time, we also build their awareness. We uh, try to explain how important forest is. We try to raise their awareness about how important forest is. We also have program under BNF, education to raise our community awareness to protect their forest. Now, in relation to forest, we not only talk about forest fire, because forest also provide knowledge, especially in Sebanang National Park as one of our landscapes. In Sebano National Park has high values, has many values uh, from the flora and fauna that is highly protected, that, high, that has high value, that must be protected by the local community as well. And talking about rainforest, there is also a high economic value that is promoted by our government, HHBK, non-timber uh, non product, like the local community, Dayak tribe, they can produce like uh, craft or weaving, and that is the uh, uh, custom area of the Dayak people, how they can produce non timber like weaving and we try to optimize the local wisdom as well and in the context of forest protection the local community actually if they don't encroach to the forest the forest will be safe so our homework is to 
make to protect the forest and to make sure uh, people not entering the forest. So that's why we need to establish the community community groups when they previously enter the forest to collect timber, which we know uh, timber and wood is protected, but we have to find ways how to substitute their livelihood. Previously, they are illegal logger, they hunt protected animals, but we need to find uh, a different uh, livelihood for, for them. And to do that, and this is a big homework for all of us, we have established the community groups, we have implemented community development, we have permaculture, working with the local community. We also, you know, to cultivate uh, honey and weaving product. Uh, so this is a big homework for NGO that focus in this area, how to find a substituted livelihood and on how to market their non-forest product. Because, because I'm very happy that we have tech expert, we have data expert. So community, many community uh, produce uh, many non-timber product. Now, with regard to technology uh, utilization, we utilize technology uh, usually for monitoring the wildlife, to monitor forest fires. And the challenges that we are facing up until now, we don't have like a collective organization that can house this technology. Maybe uh, we don't have the, you know, the consortium that also engage the government, engage the local stakeholders, uh, that engage community, engage NGO, academia. We don't have that kind of consortium yet. Maybe if we can build a consortium that house this kind of technology, uh, this consortium can do research and development, to protect the rainforest. So previously, BNF has started uh, our movement. We uh, thinking to establish a consortium that we call Drone Center. Uh, that's the name that comes into our mind. Despite the name, the function is to conduct research and development in disaster and spatial uh, uh, research. And this drone center is uh, comprised of BNF, uh, academia. We try to establish this center, whereby this drone center that filled by BNF, by academia, can conduct joint research to develop this technology so that this technology can go into the site level. Uh, technology, uh, there are many technology, but we don't know yet who can use the technology. If we uh, produce the technology, everyone can use it. For example, we have worked with Liverpool Jim Morris. We develop uh, an, AI, an AI, uh, the application called Hotspot Detection, in which the drone can detect where the hotspots are, the early hotspots, early monitoring detection of peatland fires. Because in peatland, the fire not only ha starts from the top, but also from the bottom. But the homework is where we can bring this technology, who will control it, who will use it. Like uh, drone thermal technology is considered as new technology in Indonesia. If I can say, maybe only BNF that use uh, thermal drone. The products are there, but there is no 
organization that house this technology. We have engaged the government and we asked the question, where can we bring this? And if we only just put it somewhere and not being used, but we need to identify who can house this technology. We thought that the application, the product of this, of the drone center can be replicated to other government. Let's say uh, can be replicated by the BNPB or the National Disaster Management Agency as the implementator of the technology, the drone technology that we have developed. I think the key lies in our government because we only the user so that this technology can be well distributed up until the site level. So the site level can do something as well. Okay, thank you so much. So this is about upscaling, yeah? To, uh, it's about scaling up. So to what extent we scale up this technology and this is related to the implementer. So Mr. Kuku, about the lesson learned, about the scale, scaling up, upscaling and talking about the local communities, the indigenous people. Now we'd like to hear from you how Cultiva provide access to the local community because it uh, affected by network and we talk about data sharing. So what are your thoughts about this? So talking about local community or smallholders, uh, uh, farmers, they actually the main actor of uh, 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 any supply chain. So when we have the technology, as explained earlier, technology comes in many types. It is very sophisticated and we have many engineers, but technology will come to us if it's not being used by the main actor because uh, technology should help us in doing things uh, easier. Now, uh, throughout my journey working in Cultiva, there are several steps that we uh, try to help the local community. We always ask whether the product or the application that we develop or the platform that we develop, we ask whether it fulfill their needs, the community needs. I also uh, explain about how we want to understand the user experience. So there are many research from the product team to check whether the product itself is acceptable or to understand where the pain points are. And we try to measure the user experience and that will determine our steps to improve the product. Now, the question is when the product is completed and fulfill the expectation of the local community, then what will be the impact? Well, for sure, when there is a knowledge gap, then it will be easier to address it because there is a suitability of a product and the user. So when the product is suitable, then all information, all the facilitation, the education uh, will be easier to be developed by the Cultiva implementation team. It will have a different case when we release a product that the community cannot accept. No matter how big our education effort is, it will never be effective. But when we develop a product according to their needs, then it will help us to develop the right education uh, model for them. Second, why local community is important? Because it helps us to uh, identify Cultiva program. Now, we have a program called Cultiva Skills in which uh, we involve 100, 200 field agents uh, where we hire them to help us to educate the farmers. Uh, not, not only educating the farmers, but they also do data collection. So we 
to we not only collecting the data, but we educate the farmers to understand how important the data is, so we get double positive benefit in that effort. So once all of the data is collected, and then we process it, and then we share to the client, to the end user, then what happened next? The, the company that use the farmer product, then they will measure. Let's say one farmer is considered sustainable and not uh, producing from conservation zone. Then the company will provide more incentive to that farmers. So when they having transaction with that farmers, the, the price will be premium compared to other farmers that not yet certified, let's say. So this is a product that will help uh, the farmers and our client. So to help, so when the main actor receiving the right incentive, the right product, then I believe the flow of the value chain, the supply chain, will be more sustainable. Okay, thank you so much. Audience, I believe you would like to raise question. So I'm going to provide opportunity for anyone who would like to ask questions from the presentation that our panelists has shared. So those who would like to ask questions, don't forget to mention your name, your organization, and to whom you're question is intended. So we have five minutes for the Q&A session. And our Basel Global team will help to distribute the microphone. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sabto? Yes, Miss. So, get ready. Uh, this might come as a trick question. But anyway, uh, please, uh, mention your name, or maybe you can uh, you ask question to all three. Okay, my name is Ayu. I am from uh, the grandkid of Tempo Group. We are from community. Uh, how, uh, this, okay, anyway, I would like to ask question to Kuku. You have explained that the initial approach is become easier because you adjust with the needs of the local community. When there's a so, I would like to understand what is the process, how to build rapport with the local community, because when you inform a system or technology to the local community. It should not come uh, easy in the beginning, but I uh, understand how you uh, transfer the technology to the local community. That's number one. Number two, when the farmers have used the cultivar system, what was the feedback from the system users? which are the local farmers. So, Kuku. Yes, go ahead, Kuku. Uh, should I address you as a little sister? I'm just joking. So, with regard, what efforts that we do to engage the local community, I think that was the question. Now, our effort was, so uh, if you, as all the companies who try to in provide intervention to the local community, there is also first rejection or resistance. They think this is something new that we bring to them and they don't understand. And everyone will, will try their best to convince that our product is the best that can help you with ABC. So it is a very long journey and therefore, the strategy that Cultivate team was 
Oh, uh, they, they, they. So if we, if farmer is for offered by fertilizer A, fertilizer B, it, as simple as they don't want to use if they don't bring monetary benefit to them. And as simple as our approach, we try to come to them. We take one of the uh, sam example from them and make it as a role model. And the role model will receive incentive. So at least when one community member receiving incentive, we educate these uh, individuals. And the individual should be able to influence other community members and how we select the individuals. This individual, we make them as a field agent under the cultivar project implementation. We have the role of field agent that is responsible to provide education and to collect the existing data. So we actually come to them, uh, giving them works, giving them monetary incentives so they can enjoy direct impact. So that's one strategy that we use. And second, what impact actually enjoy by the farmers? Because cultivar uh, business model is B2B, we actually don't work with the farmer directly per se. We actually work with the companies who source the raw material from the farmers. Let's say uh, uh, a chocolate bar company A, they have list of which farmers that they source the cacao from. They also have the farmer list or list of farmers. So the data collecting that we do will go to the first layer, the farmers that has been registered to this big company. And our job is to check whether they have practiced sustainable method. When they have declared they don't do deforestation, they produce uh, everything in the production zoning, they don't use antibiotic and so on and so forth. So when we have collected all of those data and goes into our system, then our system will assess whether this farmer is eligible to receive the incentive. When the farmer declared sustainable, then they eligible to receive the incentive. So in every transaction that this farmer have with the company will receive incentive. And the incentive will not only come one, it will come multiple times based on the transaction volume that the farmer has with the company. So that is the approach. OK, thank you so much, Mr. Goku. OK, one more question from the audience. Let's maintain the spirit. Hopefully, coffee and tea is available. So one more question from the floor, from the audience. Yes, go ahead. Madam, uh, can we give the microphone? Don't forget to mention your name, your organization, and to whom your question is raised to. My name is Anti. I'm from Telusuri. I'm project manager from Telusuri, uh, a media company under Tempo Group. I have a question to Mr. Resto. Yes, go ahead, uh, ma'am. So I have a question. And similar to the first question raised by Ayu, Rustu also answered that there are surrounding communities you know how to switch their livelihood to become more sustainable, how uh, to make them do green jobs. So in that process, uh, in that substituting process, were there any resistance, you know, when you giving them ideas of doing more sustainable jobs, like Restu said, you know, to protect the rainforest? Were there any resistance? And how BNF, what was BNF approach uh, towards this resistance coming from the local communities? 
And along the way, over time, along the journey of protection, monitoring, what are the role of local communities in uh, protection and monitoring activities? So it is a very smart question. It is a very complex question, actually. Okay, let's do now try to answer. Um, uh, we'll try to respond by saying this. Now, usually on the ground, community is seen as the object, but now BNF see, uh, see the community as subject, the main actor to protect rainforest. I'm talking about the local community here, as the subject no longer has object. Now, when we engage the community, we face with many challenges. And uh, some of the community, which previously do illegal logger, um, illegal mining, artisanal gold mining, illegal hunting, uh, it's very rampant in Kalimantan. And it is their culture, their customary uh, in their tribes. But now, uh, uh, regulation is changing. Previously, forest, uh, now previously it was production forest area. Like in Sebangau National Park, it's actually considered as production forest area. And there are major logging in Sebangau National Forest. However, the production forest function is changing into a conservation area becoming a national park. So the community, the tribe, can cannot do their old activities. If they continue the old practices, they will be criminalized. Now, in our activities, we try to engage the local community. For example, in our work protecting the area, we always conduct patrol every day. Every day we do patrol in the forest area. And in that patrol, we involve the community as the guardian. So the local community as forester, as the guardian, we educate them, we build their capacity. So our patrol team, all of them, coming from the local community, and they are very expert. You know, and they only graduated from high school, but they have a huge knowledge about the forest itself. And we also conduct uh, flora and fauna research. We research the biodiversity, working with several universities. Now, in our research work, we also engage the local community. In conducting the research, we engage the community to collect data. We also teach them how to analyze the data. With regard to alternative livelihood, we teach them about permaculture. We uh, try to uh, revitalize the old stories that Dayak tribe was the forest guardian in which those old culture is no longer being used. But we try to, you know, revitalize it again. Now, with regard to rejection, with regard to resistance, yes, we experience that. And we actually still finding ways, we still finding ways so that the gold illegal mining can be stopped. And uh, how, because when we, you know, offer them agriculture, they see that uh, the life, the, the the income from gold mining activities is way bigger than agriculture uh, activities, and they don't mind to go to prison. And, and but at the same time, they understand they need to guard the forest. It's for the next generation. They are aware about that. But uh, the question is how to educate them, how to raise their awareness, because this is not about 
short term, but you need to think about the long run, about your uh, next generation, because when the forest is no longer there, then who can uh, continue their life here? And as you may know, as you may know, the illegal gold mining is started from the river and then goes into the forest. Anyway, in all of our project and all of our program, we always engage the local community. And in the video, as you can see, when we utilize the technology in uh, restoring the forest area from fires, we also engage the community. In the ref reforestation process, for the crop from the uh, seeds, we engage the community to establish a nursery community to spread the seed, uh, the deforested area. And why we engage the community? Why we engage the community in the nursery activities? Because the one who knows, who are familiar about the area, is the community themselves. Yes, in BNF we have researchers, we have experts, and some of our directors are researchers, uh, researchers from Exeter, from UK. However, in terms of research, in, in terms of con knowing condition on the ground, they don't necessarily uh, know better compared to the local community. Now, in the pit land landscape, with regard what kind of crops suitable to be planted in the peatland, the local community knows more. We try to find the seed, the seedlings, and then we do nursery in the local community groups. And we try to do research, ah, this crop is suitable in this peatland. We try to measure the depth of the peatland and it turns out not the case. Then we try to use the local wisdom, and then if you want to plant something here, then you use this crop. And why is this successful? Well, this is uh, what our parents uh, told us. So we try to combine the res we try to combine our research with the local wisdom, with the local knowledge. Then by combining those two aspects, we can achieve success. So you try to combine the evidence research base and then combine with the local wisdom. So panelists, because of time limitation, well, thank you so much, Ms. Ayu and colleague for asking those two questions. There is one uh, highlight that I can draw from the discussion we had this afternoon. It's, it turns out that not only gold, not only oil and gas that we mine, but data also mine. We need a lot of data to build this synergy. So my question is, what will be the future scenario from the lens of the U.S. post lab, especially when we talk about global connection, uh, how to link with the project in Africa, Brazil, Malaysia, because we cannot moving back, right? We have to moving forward. We talk about capacity building, empowerment, movement. Now, when 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 I say movement, we, it's about moving forward. It's about the future. So this will be my last highlight questions. I would like to understand the perspective from the three panelists. What will be the future scenario? We have talked about the challenges. So let's say in. UN, Pulse Lab, in BNF, and Cultiva. Uh, what is your uh, vision and mission for the future? Maybe you can share those to us as well. And as a closing responses, the national, the international uh, ideas, Rustu uh, said, we need umbrella, we need uh, organization that can enhance the technology. So, Boge, as the representative from UN Post Lab, what will be your future scenario? Yes, thank you so much for the question. Now, with regard to future scenario, uh, the research usually called future foresight. 
considering 5, 10, 15, 25 years ahead, uh, how the future will look like. So back again to what I have said earlier, there, there is a, there is a worry uh, from the researcher. The researchers a bit worry when the open, open data is not running, when all type of open data is no longer working because there is a sector that is difficult to be addressed. Okay, let's say we have data, we open our data, but uh, a different version. If you are interested, please pay. Well, it's natural. Back again, because data is now the new gold. So, when we do future foresight, I think the future research will become more difficult to do because of uh, uh, lacking of availability data. That is why we promote, let's open our data. So data exchange can happen, and many have tried to do this. But back again, it sometimes failed. So what we need to think about the future is how, how we can provide data to prepare for the future, how all of us are aware to become a data provider. Okay, we don't have to see other organization, you know, just see our own organization, considering many termination of work and people think, oh, we need to generate our own income. And that's something that every organization has in their mindset. They need to think that they become a data provider. Because in the future, when data becoming more expensive, in which we no longer able to purchase, when then at least what local NGO can do, okay, they have drone, they collect the data, and then they store it, and then they can exchange the data or sell the data. Because what happen often is. Uh, uh, many organizations try to maintain the biodiversity and many use audio recognition. So they capture the f audio from the forest and when they hear chainsaw audio, they immediately uh, ring the alert, oh, there's a illegal logging. Well, this data should not only use for their own interest, but they keep the data, they store the data, where in the future can be exchanged, can be sold, and uh, the image recognition that can identify how AI work to uh, identify the surrounding animals. So, hope they all keep those data, and, and, and the, at the end of the day, it can be mined. So we can mine this historical data. So my hope for the future, think about, think about how to exchange data. Think about exchangeable data. OK. Mr. Kuku, Koldiva, what is your pers future perspective in one, in one minute? Yeah? OK, talk about Koldiva. We always focus on traceability, which is our biggest mission. From seat to table, we try to trace. We, we, want, we want to trace uh, all of the food on our table come from which farmers. And our future vision, our future hope, we, can, we hope that we can have more farmers that see traceability as a sustainability effort and initiative. When we have uh, more awareness, when more people are aware where their food uh, come from where, and the farmers also see this as an important thing, then it will bring positive impact to the farmers. Okay, rest two, the BNF 
perspective from Borneo Nature Foundation, what is your future scenario? Uh, scenario future, a uh, future scenario. From our side, as an NGO, how this program can reach the site level? We actually have many research results. We have do research A, B, C, D. Uh, with regard to technology, we have A, B, C, D, E. However, uh, our problem is we don't have any umbrella. We don't have any uh, organization or consortium that can house all of these uh, results. We don't have any, you know, this institution that uh, comprise of different stakeholders. We don't have it yet. For, for example, the drone data. Drone is not only about data. Data can be collected everywhere, anywhere, real time. But uh, drone is about the utilization of airspace. We need to have. Uh, an entity that control the airspace and with regard to the data that Boge said we have a project called bioacoustic project we can identify what sounds coming from the forest it can it can be the sound of Orang utan, uh, the sound of illegal logging activities, and we can identify immediately. And we hope this, when we have this organization, we hope this organization can be replicated in other areas as well. So I hear you. So we need the umbrella that can integrate all the software, hardware, all of the applied technology. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard so many knowledge, so many information from this panel discussion. Unfortunately, we are limited by time, but the most important thing that we can draw from the panel discussion, how important synergy is, how to build consistency in all stakeholders and to build a comprehensive knowledge. How to have uh, uh, and how uh, to have a monitoring and evaluation that is sustainable and supported by the policy and regulation that can protect uh, the forest uh, rainforest in Indonesia and all over the world, and it requires coordination from different stakeholders, from the government, NGO, academia, and the local community. for the sake of the next generation. So ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, thank all of the panelists. Let's give them a round of applause for uh, what they have shared. And hopefully we can continue the collaboration. Boge, uh, Restu, and my name is Ari. I would like to end and I would like to return. Mr. Morris team, you may uh, continue with the wrap up and closing remarks. So let's give another round of applause, Mr. Boge. Rest to. Good evening. Prima uh, kasih to our panelists and to the moderation. Very, very nice, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I am here to take two more minutes of your, um, of your attention. And I would like to focus it on uh, the knowledge exchange digitalization, which is part of our set project, as I am uh, one of the uh, researchers at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. It has been teased already. Uh, data is the new gold. This is why we want to be gold diggers as well. And uh, we're trying to build a database uh, for digitalization projects uh, that are linked to sustainability in a wider sense. Um, this is going to be a peer-to-peer -peer platform or a peer-to-peer -peer page. Uh, meaning that users put in cases, we evaluate cases and then put them online, and then other users can go online, compare cases, and look at them. Uh, we are currently in the phase of looking for submissions as we want to start the website early in 2023. Uh, the benefits are rather obvious, I think. Uh, it incre increases your project's visibility and range. Um, you might be seen by journalists, NGOs, and most importantly, probably other project managers, so there's uh, an aspect of learning, but there's also an aspect of teaching in a way, and uh, you will be part of a, of a, of a ever-growing network, uh, so to speak, if uh, you decide to submit a case. Um, 
this is what this is going to be probably looking like. Okay, this is a little far for a lot of you maybe, but we're going to have sort of these different cases sort of displayed. Um, there will going to be a filter function, a search function, um, so you can compare and find cases more easily. Um, so I invite you, we invite you to um, submit your cases, uh, share this link, share this QR code uh, in case you know an interesting project or you are running one yourself. Um, uh, again, feel free to share this. Uh, I hope I didn't bother you for too long, uh, and I would like to say thank you also from all of us at uh, the Humboldt Institute for uh, giving us your time and your presence. And uh, yeah, enjoy a few drinks and a bit of snacks outside. And uh, thank you, every thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moritz. I address you as Mas. It's like uh, uh, older brother, like bro. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your willingness to participate in this uh, discussion panel. We have learned many things, many insights. Uh, there will be a networking session after this. There are still coffee and tea that you can enjoy and also uh, refreshments uh, that is uh, provided in the foyer area. And if you are curious, if you want to know more, and as mentioned by Mr. Moritz, you can uh, scan this and if you would like to submit your case or if you have any questions. So, Mr. Christian, uh, can we close the session and start the networking? And thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay, until we meet again, we don't say goodbye, but until we meet again in the next activity, so let's uh, give uh, uh, a big uh, round of applause. Uh, my name is Mulati Dewi, the moderator for the afternoon and evening session. Thank you so much.